My name is Miggy. I'm a designer advocate for education here at Figma. This is Figma for EDU. We're going to cover some icon basics, how to make icons in Figma. Myself, I am Miggy. You can see me on Twitter at Miggy and other various outlines, uh, 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 sites. So you can go to figma.com slash at Miggy to see my, my files. I'm also joined by Alex, a manager on the EDU team here. Uh, so she's just kind of hidden right now, but she's running things in the back and is just the absolute best. Uh, so just so you all know, today's session is being recorded. It will be posted on the YouTube. It will be shared to you all later, but I really thank y'all for being here in person and kind of like having these moments with me. Make sure you set your Zoom chat to everyone. And remember that as you are chatting, you know, in those chats that you're very kind to everybody by joining this session today, you are abiding by our code of conduct. So please be kind. No sharing of links in the chat. You know, we'll share links out with you all, but please no LinkedIn links or anything like that. This is not the, the place for that. But, you know, once again, just be kind to one another. Like I said, let us know where you're coming from. Hey, Raymond, great to see you joining us this being your first session. I hope you come to many more and that you enjoy it. You find some value out of what we're going to give you today. So once again, Figma and Fig Jam are free for students and educators. You can head on over to figma.com slash education. It's a little bit different if you are in a boot camp or a higher education there, you can use the pro teams. But if you're coming from a K-12 space, uh, make sure you check out the K-12 page. It's just a little bit different, you know, to make sure that, you know, we, we are abiding by all the properly all the proper rules and regulations. So go to figma.com slash education, but make sure, you know, if you're in higher ed, your boot camp or like any kind of structured learning that's outside of the K-12 space, you go to that page. And uh, if you're in higher ed, you can go to that page. Uh, and get the pro team. So this, like I said, for the pro teams, for those in higher ed, for those that are in boot camps or those that are doing any kind of uh, learning in a structured environment, you can sign up for Figma. You can verify your education status. You're going to create an education team. The education team is the pro team benefit. It's going to give you the ability to use things like video in Figma, audio chat, as well as publishing libraries. So make sure that you get those pro benefits by creating an education team and you can get started with templates. So going to figma.com slash at education, there are plenty of, edu of education related templates that we have here. We have tons of them in FigJam as well as many of the workshop starting files. So if you want to see a previous workshop, you can head on over. We most recently did Figma and FigJam together. We did working with vector tools, which we're going to be covering a little bit today. Day, as well as a cool deep dive into introduction to design systems. When you click on those links, those respective YouTube videos will be in those files as well. All right. So once again, I move that over to the left. Um, we host monthly workshops. You can find more at figma.com slash events. So just ones like this. And today's agenda we're going to do a quick vector graphics overview in Figma. I'm going to show some basics of making icons. We're going to make a few icons. Once again, this file is available as a community file. So if you want to follow along, you can kind of see where I'm at. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about scaling and exporting and then open it up to questions in the audience. Once again, if you do have questions, be sure to use that Zoom Q&A panel. So then this way we can kind of collect those questions and, and work together. And I see Alex is in the file with me. I could just say hi. All right, cool. And and yes, I just want to make sure that this is this is being recorded. This this whole session is being recorded and and we are good to go. So, no need to ask if this is being recorded. It's being recorded. We promise. All right, cool. So, the first thing I want y'all to do is to kind of get comfortable in Figma. For many of you, this might be your first time in Figma, so I'm going to show you all a few things. So, Figma is a design tool. It gives you the ability to create things like graphics and text um, in this space. Over here, we have the layers panel. Up here, we have the tools panel. Over here, we have the design panel that allows us to modify the things that exist here on our canvas. So you see that I was in the intro page. I'm clicking on the recap vector shape page. Each of these pages, I can navigate up and down. So there's a a page up and page down key on my keyboard. I can actually go up and down all of those pages that way. Or if you're on a laptop, function up and function down. We'll let you go up and down there. Hey, we got Julie from Spain and we got Dia from Indonesia. What's up? 
thanks for joining today. All right. So one thing that I want to show you, this is one of the first Figma shortcuts that will really help you as you're working on this journey. You're going to see me use this uh, shortcut a bunch of times today. And what this is, is quick actions. If I click up here in the top left, you'll see the main menu and you'll see the quick actions option, which is command forward slash. If you're on Windows, you'll see a different shortcut key for that. It'll say control forward slash. And if you have a, a keyboard that is non-US based, I'm on a US based keyboard, um, there's different actions that you can show and I'll walk you through those. So here, command forward space, and you'll see this little menu pop up and I can type in things. I could type in various commands in there. So I can type in the word keyboard and you'll see keyboard shortcuts. And that's the first thing that we're gonna cover today. Since so many of you are joining us from around the globe, I want to make sure that your Figma suits you in the best way possible. So I'm going to show you how to adjust the keyboard layout to best suit the keyboard that you may be working with. So once again, I'm going to hit command P or command forward slash. If you're on Windows, it's control forward slash. I'm going to type in keyboard shortcuts. When I do that, I'm going to see this little window down here. Let me zoom it in there so y'all can see this just a little bit better. So you see we have the essential shortcuts, right? Uh, we have tool shortcuts, we have view shortcuts, and those shortcuts are going to be highlighted for you in the way that you are currently working. So if you're on a Windows machine, you're going to see Windows specific shortcuts. The cool thing that I want to represent for all of you joining us today that is not on a US keyboard here over in the far right, you can see layout, keyboard layout, US QWERTY. I'm going to click on that and you can see all of the different languages that you can associate with that keyboard layout. So I know those of y'all in Spain, you don't have that forward slash readily available for you. So this will tell you to hit command P when you're pulling that up. So just so y'all know, I want to make sure that I'm looking out for you all and that you can follow along just as fun with me. So once again, those keyboard shortcuts that we're going to be covering today, we're going to be talking about the pen tool. We're going to be talking about adding shapes and we're going to be talking about modifying them. And once again, you can see that this is where the layout is. It's in the file. So I want y'all to feel comfortable when you're working in Figma. The first thing that we're going to talk about today, if you notice up here in the top left, you see these shape tools. Using shapes is going to be a great entry point into working with your icons. So you might notice as I'm moving around here, I'm holding the space bar. The space bar pulls up this little hand and allows me to drag. If you're on a laptop, you can use the touch bar to kind of navigate around this space. But if you have a mouse and keyboard, I'm pressing the space bar to navigate that around. Here is the square. You notice when I select that square, I have some colors over here. I can select that. I can change the color of that. So I have this square here. Let's just drop in a few more shapes. So let's say the star tool. So when you're trying to make things a little bit more complex, these additional shapes have hidden properties that allow you to make them more meaningful. So this star tool, I can adjust this point and move this out and adjust these values. All of these values you'll notice will be over here on the top right as well. So here, I'm going to pull up this star tool and you can see I could change the amount of points it has and I can change its angle. And what's cool is you'll be able to use what we refer to as shape primitives. You'll be able to use these as you're building out your own icons. And we're going to show you some methods to do that. So it's important that you first get an understanding of where these icons are. And sometimes you might notice this extra spacing around an icon. And the reason that spacing exists is because it's trying to center that shape according to kind of like its center of mass, right? So if you have something like a triangle, and if you want to center that triangle, right, you kind of need this other space here to center it properly. Now, if I want to expand that, let's say I only want this little bounding area onto that triangle. Let's, let's do a deep cut really quick. If I want to flatten this, I can hit Command E. It's a Control E on Windows or I can right click and choose flatten, right? So right now when I'm using these shape primitives, some of these shape primitives, you know, I can non-destructively adjust these values and these values are adjusting according to the, the physics center of that shape 
And that's so it can be better censored in a space. So not according to its physical bounds. And this is an important thing when you're considering design and building out UI. So when you think about that play button, that play button, let's just show this as an example. I don't want to dwell on this too much, but I'm going to press the O key. Here we go. I got a circle. I'm going to put that in. And when I put this play button, let's bring that to the front. You know, when I put this play button in, it's going to censor much better you know, using the bounding box of its of its physics sensor, then if I was to flatten it and center it that way. So we see that this is centered according to the bounds of the shape. Doesn't look so good. It looks a little off to the left. This object right here, this is centered according to its its physics sensor. So it's going to look a lot better, right? And and we're going to be talking about that as well. Um Cool. I'm so glad that that, that y'all are digging this. I'm seeing it. Here we go. All right. So next up, we're going to talk about vector objects. When you're building out shapes and when you're drawing these, these points out, vectors are infinitely large, infinitely small. It's much better than if you're thinking of a photograph. A photograph is a raster-based image, and it's based off of pixels. When you're drawing things like a, an icon, you know, you're using these shapes and these vector points. So if I was to, let's say if I was to draw a circle here, right? So I press the O key, and I clicked and I drew a circle. And here we go. Let's let's do another quick tip. When I draw this circle, if I hold down the shift key, it'll keep its proportion, right? The shift key will hold its proportion. If I don't press the shift key, it kind of goes in all manner of ways. The shift key, it's going to keep the proportion and it's holding, it's drawing it from the top left. If I hold down the option key or the alt key on windows, it'll scale it from the center. Right. So let me make that a little bit darker so you can see that a little bit better. Right. So I'm holding down the alt key or the option key. It draws it from the center. Right. Center, just the alt key, shift and alt. It'll hold that. These modifier keys are really important when you're working with tools. And sometimes you might forget what they are and that's OK. So just hold one of them down and hold the shift key and you'll see that it's drawing from the bottom left. But by holding the option or the alt key, it draws out from the center. So knowing these little tricks will start to give you a good understanding of being more intentional about drawing the shapes that you're drawing. So the thing that I want to highlight here is when I double click on this, right? When I double click on that shape, it goes from being a shape to showing the vector nodes that are drawing these shapes, right? So if I click on one of those nodes, I'll see these Bezier handles. And what they're doing is they're drawing and, and basically manipulating this curve that's being represented there. So what's cool about this is because it's math-based, this can be scaled up, it could be scaled down. It's ideal for print. It's ideal for using in a user interface because it can be scaled to the different um, user interface uh, pixel density. And I know that that might be a new concept for many of you, but basically like an iPhone screen, you know, it has much smaller pixels. So it's helpful to use a vector graphic that can scale accordingly. So it can be made a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, depending on the needs of the screen. So whether it's going to be on like a high definition TV or it's going to be on a super high definition iPad, you will have uh, be comforted by knowing that the graphic is going to look good. So here, what I'm going to show you really quick is that if I hold down the command key, right, uh, or the control key on Windows, and I click on each of these points, right, it releases those vector nodes. And if I hit the command key on each of those points, it re-adds those Bezier curves, and it tries to do so in a nice way. The, the program tries to figure out what you're trying to do, but what's really fun about this circle example is I can do that and get a perfect kind of diamond and then kind of go back to that circle. So you can see how these are created and how those curves are generated. I like it. I like to think of it as like a fun little exercise that I like to prefer um, to, to perform. So once again, Bezier handles are going to be these handles that are uh, uh, helping to guide you know, how these shapes are being drawn. Um, and it's something that, you know, it takes a bit to, to master and understand, but rest assured, there's a bunch of different controls over here on the top right. Let me zoom in just a little bit more. When I select that point, you'll see 
exactly. When I click on that, that handle, I can see the location and space of where that handle exists. So I can move that X point, I can move that Y point, and I can change how these handles behave because more often than not, you want them to be well controlled and sit at nice angles. And what's cool is that here I can set this to, you know, mirror the angle, or I can say mirror the angle and length and, and, and it'll behave in that way. Let me zoom in just a little bit more so you can see that, right? And these controls give you a lot of flexibility when you're making these shapes, but it can also lead to a lot of confusion. So what I want you to do is at least be aware that when you're drawing these shapes and these points, you do have that control over them over here on the right. So not that many people are, are that attuned to, to how that works. So vector editing mode, once again, if I draw a rectangle, right, this is a shape, but once I double click on it, I'm now in vector editing mode. So I'll see all of these different options up here. Here, right? That's a paint bucket tool. We're not really going to talk about that one too much today. But here, this bend tool is really important in that it allows you to modify these curves. Let's make that red. There we go. And uh, that bend tool, you know, when you activate it, it gives you a lot of control over how this shape is being put together. Okay, so uh, one last thing that I do want to like kind of emphasize today is that Figma is a bit unique in that it allows for vector networks. And what that means is in other vector applications, when you draw out like points, right? So I draw this this triangle, I can't add another line here, right? Like this is all I'm this is all that I have in certain vector applications. But Figma is unique in that I can use this pen tool and I can add another point off of there and I can connect it and I can create this relationship between all of those lines. So I can add in additional nodes, additional vector nodes to have more control over this illustration that I'm drawing here. And one of the ways that I'd like to demonstrate this, I'm gonna press the P key. I'm gonna click a dot right here. I'm gonna hold down the shift key to keep it at a straight line. So once again, P key is the pen tool. I'm going to click, I'm going to click, I'm going to hold down that shift key. And by holding the shift key, you'll notice that it keeps everything at a nice, even angle. And so I can keep that angle. I could draw that there. And if that line is still sticking, right? You press the escape key and that goes away. And I'll show you one more time. I'm going to click that point right there, hold down the shift key. And you'll see what's really cool is that Figma is like, it's trying to help you out. So if I hold down that shift key, you'll see it snap with that red line. And then I can click and there we go. Uh, and once again, if I have this extra line, you're like, no, I could just hit undo and I can press escape. Undo being command Z or control Z. So what's cool about this is you can draw some pretty great shapes and other vector editing applications. It doesn't give you the ability to have multiple lines drawn from that single node. So I do want to highlight that and, and the fact that it's important. Um, here too, I just want to highlight that like as you're working, you know, you want to um, modify these things. So like I'm drawing these lines here. And when I select this over here on the right, you'll see this stroke panel. This stroke panel allows me to control the thickness of this line. And this is going to be important when you're building out icons because you're going to want to have consistency. So it's important for you to manage and control the stroke uh, width so here, if I set this to like, let's say 20, I'm actually working with a very large object, as you can see here, um, but I can change how this stroke appears. So over here is the advanced stroke settings. So when I click on that, I look down here and I can see, ooh, the stroke style, I can change that to, to dashed. Uh, the endpoints, I can actually make them all round. And what that does is it allows me to have these like round endpoints, which is kind of great because that can affect the way that my icon may look the style of that icon. So once again, with this object selected, we are in vector editing mode. I'm going to come over here to the stroke, click on that 
three dots menu. And here's the advanced stroke panel. And one other thing here is those endpoints around, but let's say I want my whole icon to be very consistent. And this endpoint right here, I also want that to be round. So right here, I can see the join and I could change the join type. This will give you a little bevel and this will make it round. And there you go. You know, in, in other applications, it might be a little bit more difficult to get that nice rounded edge exactly the way that you want to, but this advanced stroke panel is going to make that much easier for you. And oftentimes it's overlooked. So sometimes people just kind of forget that it's there. So I'm here highlighting it and telling you about how kind of great it is. It's just really great. So I'm going to drag this object. Uh, let's see, I'm going to select it. I'm going to hold down my option key or the alt key. That's going to let me drag it over here to the right. And the one thing I just want to talk about here is, is outline mode. Uh, these are all concepts that once we dig into kind of building some icons and some basics that are going to benefit you and help you to kind of work better. Um, so even if you're just getting started, just kind of being aware of some of these concepts is going to help you on your journey to being like best icon designer ever, which is probably Noah because he's already, he's in this chat and I'm really appreciative that Noah's here. So I'm going to select this shape. I'm going to press shift O right? Shift O is going to bring up outline mode. And what outline mode does is allows you to kind of see those lines and I can see the thickness and, and it gives you a much better view of how this is constructed. Once you start creating very complicated vector artwork or icons, right? Like, you know, if you have additional points and you really want to get a sense of them, outline mode is going to help you see this. Now to leave outline mode, Shift O, and I'm back out. So Shift O, Shift O. And um, oh, cool. I, I answered a question somebody wanted to ask. That's great. So over here in the top right, um, let's see, outlines. So in outline mode right here, if you ever forget about it, if you look over here, you'll see outlines. And here you can also include object bounds. So when I press shift, oh, I'll actually see the bounds of that object. So there's there's some settings that can be adjusted here for the outline mode. So include hidden layers. You can hide things and still see them. And I can include object bounds. I usually have this one turned off. So not that many people are aware that you can control such things. I'm here to tell you that you can. All right. Uh, one other thing that we want to talk about, I'm going to bring up that quick menu that we talked about in the beginning, uh, all the way at the beginning of this file. And um, I'm going to bring up the snap settings. So snap settings are really important and can really affect the way that you work. So right here, you'll see that there's these options, snap to pixel grid, snap to geometry, snap to option. All right, I'm back. I just had to sneeze. I apologize for that. So snap to pixel grid, snap to geometry, snap to objects. I'm going to show you how to pull that up. When I press command forward slash, I'm going to be able to type in the word snap. And that's going to give me the ability to turn these all on or off. So this will allow me to change how these objects snap. And what I'm here to tell you is that sometimes when you're working with vector graphics, without the snap to geometry turned on, you might run into issues with the pen tool. So here, if I'm drawing this, this object, and uh, let's say I want to add a point right there. When I hover over, the pen tool lets me add a point right in the middle. You know, without the snap to geometry turned on, um, it might not be as easy to do. So make sure you look at your snap settings if something doesn't feel like it's working correctly. So I just wanted to emphasize that. Most of the times, depending how I'm working, I will turn on and off my snap to pixel grid, but I leave the other two uh, kind of working pretty regularly. All right. So any any questions at this point? Um, what I would like what I would like y'all to do is please answer um, your your please ask your questions in the Q and A panel. I know someone asked me if uh, if Adobe Illustrator has vector networks like Figma. The last time that I used Adobe uh, Illustrator, it did not, and that was actually one of the reasons why I first started getting into Figma. Um, and Snap. Oh, what is Snap? Someone's not aware of what Snap is. So here, what I'm going to do. I'm going to draw in the F key and I'm going to draw this. And uh, so uh, let's say if I have like a grid, right? I'm going to turn on a little layout grid and, and this grid is set to like one pixel, right? So you see all of these pixels here. When I press the P key, 
when I'm moving this pencil up and down, you see how it's kind of like magnetically snapping to that point, right? And, and what it does is it allows me to be very precise with how these objects are being drawn so I can draw it right on those points. And then uh, rounded corners. So if you want to round the corners, it usually depends a little bit. Uh, so here I can select these and I can round those corners out. So there we go, I can round those corners out. If you have a regular shape, um, over here you'll see when you move to the corner, you can actually round those out right there. And you'll see like with my snapping turned on, it's like allowing me to snap to like the pixel and the half pixel. All right. So hopefully that answers your question. Once again, the snap settings, command forward slash or command P type in snap. Um, normally, like I said, this could be turned on or off depending on the type of work that I'm doing, but I'm typically going to have these two on unless it's kind of snapping in ways that I don't really want it to. All right. So here's this file that was just shared um, by Alex uh, contains a bunch of different kind of like pen tool uh, basics. This is also covered in the vector network tool basics. Um, so once again, you know, the uh, working with vector tools workshop. So we covered this a little bit more in depth, um, but here I'm just going to show you one or two cool things. This measure distance, right? If I'm drawing vector points, Let's make that just a little bit bigger. Um, I press the V key. And what's cool is if I select between two points, it'll actually tell me the distance, right? So I'm holding down the option or the Alt key, and I can actually begin to measure things out. So there we go. So um, basically the, the, the pen tool, uh, as you're working and you're drawing vector lines, if you ever need to, to escape out of using that line, press the escape key, right? I can always click and add additional points. I do want that snapping turned on. Um, when I'm, when I'm selecting and I'm working in the vector editing mode, you can always select between two straight lines and click a point. And what that's going to do is it's basically creating a point directly at the midpoint which is really helpful for making certain icons. And uh, we'll we'll kind of dig into that just a little bit more. We'll be covering pretty much all of these concepts once we get into the next session as well. And uh, one other thing that I wanted to highlight here, the, uh, the join tool is kind of great in that if I was to make this shape, right? Let's say I am, uh, let's say I make this shape right here. And then I'm going to hit the command key, which is the bend tool to kind of like make a little curve, right? And I'm still in this kind of vector space and I, I have, you know, this other shape over here. Now, let's say I want to join those two points together, right? I can hit command J. Command J is going to create or control J if you're on Windows. It's going to create a straight line between them both. However, I'm going to hit undo. If I hit uh, Command Shift J, oh no, what is it? Command Alt J, yeah, Command Alt J between those points. No, oh, wait, why isn't it working? Control Alt J. Did somebody change my shortcut on me? Let's see. Here we go. Here we go. Oh, I think somebody changed something on me. It used to work. Let me just make sure it's still on the keyboard panel. Keyboard. Shortcuts. Otherwise, I'm just going to move on. Let's see. Transform. Edit. Text. Tools. Where is it? I think something might have changed on me. So, otherwise, otherwise, I will take a look at it. Here we go. Yeah, Shift Command J. Why didn't it do it? Huh. Sometimes things work uh, not as expected. Oh, I think I know why. I do know why. All right. Cool. Sorry. I've I, I figured this out. Apologies. So uh, it needs it needs like a like a bezier handle on that edge, and it'll smooth join. Like, I'll just show you this one more time. My apologies. Um, thank you. I pr appreciate that. So basically, here uh, it needs it needs something. It needs like a handle to kind of work off of, right? It needs like a trajectory. So this bezier handle is going up, right? This bezier handle is going down. If I hit Command J, it makes a straight line. If I hit Command Shift J which 
I did wrong here. I didn't write this right. This is shift. And, and my muscle memory knew it. Here we go. I'm going to, I'm just going to have to adjust that book shift. And let's move that over. There we go. So, um, uh, Thanks for, for bearing with me, folks. So when I select those two points, command shift J, and it'll create a nice smooth join. That's what we would like to see. That's the crowd pleaser right there. So I have this different trajectories of these points and command shift J will come through and make that a nice smooth join. Likewise, if I want to delete points, right? If I just come in here and I select that point, I press delete and it's gone, right? That's cool, but maybe that's not what I'm looking for. Let's say I wanted to delete and heal it, right? Like I want it to look good. Delete and heal is going to be shift delete, right? So select that, delete and heal, shift delete. And it's going to do its best to make that look as best as possible. So there we go. So delete and heal is, right? Select that, shift delete. Uh, so this is really great when you're cleaning up your vector graphics and you need to just remove extraneous points. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to start talking about icons now. Uh, so one link that I do want to highlight here, um, just as like a good place to get started, especially if this is brand new to you, uh, material symbols and icons from, from Google fonts. Uh, there's a ton of examples here, but the reason that I'm highlighting this is just so you can start to see the variety of, of uh, how these fonts can be, be organized and, and kind of put together, right? So here I'm able to kind of change. So they've kind of created a system for how they construct their icons. So I can say, okay, do we want these icons as fills? Do we want to reduce the weight of the stroke of those icons? Uh, do we want to change the emphasis or the grade? Or how do we want to control its optical size. These are all properties that you need to begin thinking about once you start creating sets of icons. So in this workshop today, we're just going to cover some of the basics and some of the tools, but you know, um, as you start to dig deeper, it's much more about creating consistency and, um, understanding the properties of icons that make them feel very much like a family. So that link is here. It's within the file itself. So you can check it out at material.io. Um, but basically I just wanted to dive right into it and I'm going to make a location services icon. This right here is a frame. So I'm drawing out a frame. I press the F key. And I draw out a frame. And because this is an icon, it's going to be quite small, right? So this is going to be 24 pixels by 24 pixels. Uh, what I'm doing is I press the F key, I hold down the shift key and I make that frame. There we go. We got a frame. And now let's say if I want to see a little grid in that frame as well. So that 24 pixels, about 24 pixels, I can select that frame, come over here to the layout grid, and uh, I can basically change how this grid is being applied. And because we have 24 pixels, we want that to be, you know, nice and even. So let's let's bring down that size to, let's say, like four. We could bring it down to two pixel grids. And, and what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to show you how I would make a location services icon. Um, so this is a fun example that I saw on Twitter once um, by a designer uh, named Morgan. And what he did was basically it's like, okay, we have a square and I'm going to just take that point and move it up there, right? And then you get this cool arrow. And the reason I love this example, or actually, let me, I could even move this down here a little bit, right? Uh, what's really cool about this example is that sometimes when you're building icons, you need to take a slightly different approach to how you might build a shape than, than what you may think is the right way. So like here, I can like look at this icon and I can say, okay, add a point, add a point, add a point, add a point. Or I can start to look at some of the underlying aspects of it. Like, oh, okay, there's a, there's a, there's a square here, you know, oh, like if I just draw that square and just move that point, like that might save me some time. So I'm finding a kind of, kind of like a commonality or like a common shape in that space. So that being said, let's say if I was to make a, a map icon. So a map icon, uh, let's say I, I start with its, uh, its shape, right? So I start with that, that circle, 
you know, so the map icon has that circle and I'm not trying to draw it from, from scratch because then, then I have to mess with the Bezier curves and that might be a little bit too much, but what I can do is I can start with that shape. And then I realize that this bottom point down here, that's the only angle. And I'm like, Oh, Hey, I remember that example that Miggy showed me where he converted, you know, those Bezier handles just to an angle. So what I'm going to do is with that point selected, I'm going to hold down the command key, right? So here I draw a circle. So this is a circle. I double click it. So I'm inside of vector editing mode. I can select this point down here and I can command click on that point. And this now makes it a sharp edge. And then I can just bring that down. Right. And so we can see here, I have these Bezier curves on either side. I can also adjust those as well as I'm kind of building the character of this icon. So here I'm going to select this point. I can press the shift key. I can press the shift key and then I can deselect this with the shift key. So now I have just those two points and I can actually bring this down to kind of control the overall shape of it. Right. So as opposed to like selecting these individually and manually controlling it, right. I'm trying to consider, you know, how do I keep things in lockstep, right. I'm pressing the shift key, press the shift key. So even if I were to, uh, I just want to select that point, select that point, deselect that point. There we go. So as I'm moving this, I'm controlling those handles together at the same time. Another fun thing to do is when I select those handles, I can make sure that I align them together. So let's say if, um, you know, this handle is up here, I can press the shift key. I can press the shift key, press the shift key and I'm clicking, right? And let's say I want those two handles to align. Um, oh, wait, that doesn't work. Oh, oh, that's right. That's only on points. Sorry, I can't align my, my handles. But uh, here we go. Sometimes I forget these things. It's okay. So here we go. I can select those handles. I can move those around together. But if I select two points, right? Let's say this point was kind of up here. I can select both of those points and I can align them to the bottom of both of those points. So I, let's say this point was up here for some reason, right? I can align those to the top and I can move them down together. So it's ways to, to think about these. And by the way, um, it's, it's not just the, the, the shortcut keys. It's, it's about understanding what the keys do, right? The shift key typically keeps things together and organized, right? And it allows you to select multiple things, which is pretty common in, in the OS. So if I press the shift key, right, it's usually that I'm allowed to, I'm adding something to a group or moving something to a group, right? And, and understanding those modifiers. Sometimes I forget the modifiers and I'm just like, oh, okay, is it the alt key? Oh no, it's the, the shift key. Oh no. And, and with that, you're going to start to come to a better realization of how these things work. So it's kind of like understanding the system. Um, so the shift key is a modifier key, the option or the alt key is a modifier key, the command or the, the control key is a modifier key. And, and actually, that's how I usually discover things, right? So I'll be here and I see this point. I hold down the option key and I'm like, oh, I could duplicate that point over there. Oh, I could duplicate that point over there. And you start to find these like new ways of working. Uh, oh yeah, I could do a hard icon. Hard icons are fun. Uh, I can press the P key to draw a point, point, point. Let me reduce that stroke down, right? And then what I do is I just apply those little endpoints there as like little rounded caps. So the the hard icon, the way that I make this uh, is just with these like little caps. So then I can actually bring this down in size. Um, and then kind of control it that way. Now I can also expand this, right? So I can right click and I can outline this stroke. So that way it's no longer, it's no longer reliant on the stroke itself, right? And so I have videos of these. You can check out figma.com um, or youtube.com slash figma. Uh, I have a number of these examples. If you take a look and, and you search for those, uh, I have one where I do a really big deep dive into to hard icons. So one thing that I do want to like highlight, this is a little bit more advanced before we get into making some more icons. And I highly recommend, I'm going to be talking about the uh, 
uh, the uh, the font awesome uh, config talk as well. So Noah, I, I saw him here today. I don't know if Jory's here. Um, they're going to be digging deep into how they actually apply a lot of these concepts. So make sure you register. You can register free at config.figma.com. Um, and I'll probably bring up this again at the, at the very end. But I just want to make sure that I'm I'm letting y'all know Noah's, yeah, he's there still. Word. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't lose him quite yet. Um, but they'll be talking about a lot of these concepts in depth and in real life applications uh, for, for their company. Cause I know we're kind of limited on time here, but the one thing that I do want to highlight here is we have these things called Boolean operations. And what a Boolean operation is, is it allows you to make basic shapes, right? So I make a shape, right. And I can duplicate it. Um, and I can make those shapes into a brand new shape. So I can select those. I'm just going to duplicate those over there, but I can select these and up here with them selected, you will see these options. So union selection, right? You'll see Boolean groups. And what it does is it looks at the two and it figures out how to make a new shape of them. So either it merges them together. Um, it finds the difference between them. It pulls out the intersection of their shapes, or it excludes one from the other. So here, um, so with Figma, so Adobe tools, oftentimes it's not drag and drop. Uh, I mean, it's an entirely different ecosystem, um, but you can copy as SVG, you can copy as PNG. So right here, even as I'm working, I can copy paste this as SVG and bring it into Illustrator as a vector, or I can copy it as PNG, bring it into Figma. Um, so it's just a matter of like navigating those, those file kind of, kind of differences, but so once again, not to get too off track, I can select both of these shapes and up here, what I can do is I can union them together. So that makes one single shape. Now, what I'd like to do is I'm just going to move this up top so you can see what's happening um, over here on the right. It actually keeps this as a, a non-destructive group. So what's happening here is that this is both of these objects, right? I changed that color. It's just, it's just one object, but inside nested are the two individual circles. So I can select that object and I can do things like round out the, the edges. I can make it look, you know, like a, uh, like a, like a, like a peanut, right? So I have this, this, this peanut shape, but if I want to, I can still go in to that individual circle and, and control it even though the outside, the Boolean object, right, it's still live uh, and it's allowing you to see that, that shape. So even if I was to be inside of here, right, so I'm inside and I'm going to duplicate that circle, right, now we got three. And, and as I'm moving this around, you know, it's still honoring the um, rounded corners that's applied to that parent object. And what's cool is that I can press the O key and I could draw in another shape. Let's say I want to subtract a circle from the middle of this. I can select them together, come up here, and I can subtract it. So now you can see I have this, this new shape that I created. And we can use outline mode, shift O, to see all three of those shapes constructing it. So I can still select and move this around while I'm in outline mode. I can move that circle and I can move these objects and uh, I can exit outline mode and you can see it's still applied here. So likewise, I can do other effects like a, like a drop shadow. Let's make that uh, let's drop shadow a little bit, bit bigger um, or even like an inner shadow. Let's uh, change that. to like an inner shadow and let's make that like a highlight and blur that out, move that in, move that down. So you see that, this newly constructed object is there. So it has the, the, the highlight and the drop shadow. And you can see inside here, so I have the subtract and I have that circle and I have that union and the three circles inside of the union. So that's all nested. Now, if I want to, let me duplicate this. Oops, I'll duplicate the whole thing. And uh, I'm holding down the option key to duplicate it. If I want to flatten this out and just be one single object, right? It'll be no longer editable, but I can make it as one single thing. Uh, I can flatten this. And now this subtract, right, is just one thing. It's just all the clean vector points versus this, which is still, you know, individual non-destructive objects.
So next, I want to talk about components. So a component is an object that you want to reuse. We typically use these for like buttons, um, but I have a lot of fun with these to make, you know, these kind of like fun little shapes. So components are absolutely great if you um, want to make something reusable. Let's say you're making an icon and that bit of the icon is going to be used in multiple parts of that icon, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a shape, just kind of keeping an eye on Tom there. I'm going to draw a shape and let's make that white. There we go. Right, so I have this piece. Let's just say, well, let's make a better piece, right? Let's say, uh, let's, let's use the teardrop example where like I have a, I have a shape, I double click, I click on that point, right? So I got a, a fun little, little teardrop here, right? And then I can come up here. I'm going to make this a component. So as a component, I can name it, let's say teardrop and, uh, I can, uh, duplicate it. So I can hold on the option key. So I have a copy. This is an instance of it. So that means if I make a change to the component, the instance follows, follows it. Um, and I can duplicate this. So I'm going to hold down the option key, bring this down. Let's rotate that, right? I'm going to select them both. I'm going to duplicate command D and then just rotate that. And so now when I make any changes to this one, it happens to the other ones. Um, and it's it's kind of fun. You can create some really cool outcomes from that. So when you take the concept of Boolean operations and components and you put them together, right, um, then it gives you the option to make these like really fun objects. So what I'm doing here is I am taking uh, this this gear piece, right? So this is made into a component. I have one. I'm going to hold down the option key. Let's drag this down. Let's rotate that. I have this one. Let's hit command D. I'm going to duplicate it. We'll hold down the shift key and rotate it. Duplicate. Oops. Uh, let's copy and duplicate. And command D is duplicate. Control D on Windows. Here we go. I have those pieces. Now I'm going to draw in a, a circle in the middle. Let's move that out. Right. So this is kind of all together and there's actually alternate ways of doing this. I can select them all together and now let's union them. Right. So now they're all as one piece, but I could still go into this gear and still make. Oh, no, did I not? Oh, psh, I made a mistake. My bad. Let me undo real quick. So what I didn't, what I did is I grabbed the rectangle inside of the component. I didn't use the component itself. Let's actually use the component. There we go. And uh, let's uh, do this. So I'm going to select them, duplicate, rotate, duplicate, copy, duplicate, rotate. I know it's not perfect, but you know, you still understand the concept. So I have all of these pieces. So see, I can I can control them, and they're all moving together, right? And I can draw in that circle. There we go. Drawn in that circle. Boom, let's align it perfectly. Let's union them together. And even though that they're unioned, the components still work. And I can select that whole thing and I can round out those corners. And look, those corners are now rounded, right? But these gear pieces are still inside, right? So this is being applied to the union object, right? You want to look at your layers. And inside the union, I have all of those individual gear pieces, and they're all just instances of this first gear piece. So anytime you need something that's like reusable in an element, and likewise, I can add or I can subtract another little piece out of here. So I can draw in a circle and uh, can select them and I can subtract it. And so if I hit, let's say I want to edit it, I hit the command key or the control key and I control click, I can control where that circle lives. And remember, think of the, the order of operations here where we have the, the subtract object, right? The circle is being cut out of the union and the union is putting together all of these pieces, right? And then here, just like that, I could change the color of it. Or, or here we go, I'm going to press shift X. And you're like, what shift X? Shift X swaps the fill and the stroke. So I can instantly with shift X, you know, that object, I have the fill version and I have the stroke version. And as the stroke version, I can control whether or not that stroke sits on the 
inside, the center, or on the outside of the object. And you'll notice how it actually reflects in the shape itself. So here on that stroke, I can control whether or not, see when it's on the inside, it's relating to the inside bounds of that shape. When it's on the center, right, it's kind of like on the in and then the out. But when it's on the the outside, you see it's kind of riding out the outside. So if I press Shift O, you'll get a much better sense of how that is being created. So once again, on the inside, the center, right? You see the line is dead center and the outside. So these types of decisions really impact the way and the style of your icons. So uh, here you can see, I actually have a, a whole YouTube where I'm going through a bunch of these, these icons that I have. Um, all of these icons that are here have been made as, as components. So then that way they can be reused. Um, and once you have an instance of a component, right? So this is the gear component. This is an instance. Uh, you can change properties like the color. And as you uh, want to like adjust these, right? Let's say I want to scale it, right? Sometimes they're not going to scale depending on the constraints that are set on the frame. So the frame itself might have given constraints on how it behaves. But if you want to scale it, we have a scale tool. So I'm going to press the K key, right? The K key is going to bring up the scale tool. Uh, it's right under here. So if you see move is the normal tool, we press V, press that, go back. Scale tool is the K key. And that K key I could just type in a value. I could say, oh, hey, I want this like 4X and it's going to be four times that size. I could say, oh, hey, I want it to be 280, you know, pixels. Uh, oh, there we go. I made it. I made it really big. Uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. Sorry, width. That's what I meant to do. I could say 280 pixels by 280 pixels. There we go. So this scale tool is going to give you a lot more flexibility when you, while you're beginning to control those. Uh, so one thing that I did want to cover, I am running short on time. I know that there's a lot of content and honestly, this can be an entire course. Uh, I just wanted to give you all some basics and some basic concepts to work with. Uh, I did want to cover the, the icon grid, but as I mentioned, I'm going to hand that off to the uh, font awesome talk at, at config. Um, once again, I also have a bunch of, of YouTube videos. These are located here. Type in Miggy and icon, and there's about 15 different videos where I walk through many of these concepts, including the icon grid. But fundamentally what I do want to, to leave you all with um, today, uh, why can we not uncomponent? Uh, so you can't break a component, but you can break its instance. So I can right click and I can detach that instance and then you can change this. Or you can select this. You could press enter. When you press enter, you select all the children and then you can like move those out. But uh, here I do want to show you all. Let's see. Let's see. I do want to cover at least maybe like, you know, how I've drawn, you know, like maybe one or two more of these icons. Um, or should we get to questions, Alex? All right, let's go, let's go into questions for sure. All right. So lastly, I just did want to say like, as you're building out icons, the way that they exist as components makes it much easier when you're building out UI, using consistent framing and using an icon grid will actually help you kind of like build these out. And as you are creating these libraries, uh, I do want to also just give a, a shout out to, to Font Awesome because um, you know, like they're making tons of libraries uh, that are fully usable that work as icon fonts. So you could just kind of type them in and, and use them in that way. Uh, but let's do get to questions. All right. So confused about Boolean, flatten, create, outstroke. Can you tell me the difference by examples for designing icons? Which one's recommended? It's not necessarily that um, that there's one way for designing icons. Uh, basically, it's, it's how you generate the shape that you want to generate. Um, so as mentioned with like Booleans, like if I have a circle um, and I have like, I want to make a little donut icon, I can copy, I could paste this, this circle here, um, and bring this down. Now I can just make that background, the background color, but it's not quite right. I actually need to remove this circle from the bigger circle. So in that instance, I select them. Here, let me just make this a different color so you can see that. I can select them and I'm going to use a subtract. 
So then this way, um, what we have is an actual hole. Like if I put in the, the drop shadow, right. Um, because it's actually much more difficult to make that by hand to go in and add individual points to kind of create that out. So oftentimes when you're generating icons, you need to consider how are you cutting things out of, out of other things. Um, so like, even if you consider like, let's say if I was to make like the command key, right. Um, I might look at the command key as four squares, right. And then, um, Let's put them as as strokes. Let's swap the fill and the stroke. Um, and here, let's make that black. Let's put them all to the center. Let's expand them, right? And so here, this is the beginning of that command key. You know, I can basically say, okay, let's select those points and and round them out. You know, let's select these points and round them out. You know, let's select these points, round them out, and select these points and round them out. And I have I have a command key, um, so it's it's about looking at and, and identifying what it is you need. So now these are all separate objects, and I want to bring them together. I can select them all, and I can press Command E or Control E on Windows, and now it's one single vector object, right? So now look, they're all together. So what I did was I made the paths and then I flattened them down. And oftentimes, like you know, you're going to make things the hard way, but as you're working and as you're beginning to look at these things, you're going to start to see these kind of like shortcuts. You're going to start to see the shapes within the objects. Um, so how to cut an object, you want a half circle. Um, so if you want a half circle, you press the O key, draw it a circle in Figma. We have this thing called the arc tool. I'm going to click on that little dot and boom, there we go. I got a half circle. So you just sweep that at 50%. So I can actually make this a quarter. Um, if I want to bring this out, I could bring the ratio from the sensor and I got a nice little, little arc. So in Figma, um, that, that allows you to kind of generate that like little kind of like rainbow shape. Uh, one fun thing about this though, let's say if I was to make this into like an activity, right? If I round out those corners, those aren't so great. Let me make that black so y'all can see it a little bit better. However, if when I draw out that circle, I could draw out that arc, right? I can adjust that sweep. And here, if I bring that ratio all the way to the edge and I swap the fill and the stroke, let's press shift X to swap the fill and the stroke. Let's expand that out. So what I have here is now a stroke value and I can apply end caps. There we go. And now I have end caps and now this is going to look much better than, than this, right? See, that doesn't look so good. This looks great. And I can set that to the, the outside. I can set it to the center. So it's a matter of evaluating what it is you need to accomplish. Um, and trust me, for me to kind of like begin to get to these points, it takes, it takes a lot of work. Uh, the reason I like working with Figma is because it makes a lot of that much easier and allows me to kind of think of it in a slightly different way. Um, but this allows me to say, oh, hey, cool. Now I can really have more control over how this is put together uh, versus drawing all of those points individually. Two more questions. Thank you, Alex. Uh, do I re usually remember all the shortcuts when I use Figma? Uh, no, usually it's a matter of what I'm going to be working on. And sometimes I bring up a few extra shortcuts for myself. The thing that I use most often is command forward slash, and I will type things in. So if I'm going to change my nudge amount, that's the amount that an object moves when you press the arrow key, right? Type in nudge, and I could type that value in here. Usually for icons, I have my small nudge set to 0.5. So I can move a line on like half pixels if I need to. Um, or, you know, like I will just type this in. So usually like if I'm going to be doing product design work, I will just kind of get, I'll like look up some shortcuts I'm going to be using a lot and then I'll put it on the screen. And then, so that way I'm remembering, oh yeah, Miggy, like that'll be much faster. So in the same way I might, you know, like working with y'all today, I might just kind of bring this up. Um, and that keyboard shortcuts pane that I brought up. Uh, with command forward slash keyboard shortcuts, I often have to look back to it, you know? So even earlier today, I was like, oh yeah, the the smooth join was kind of wrong. And like, I just need to have a quick check-in. So if I'm not using something frequently, I'll forget about it. And then like, I'm just like, oh, hey, I'm going to use that. So let me just kind of like load that up in my brain. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to be using this a lot. Let me get comfortable with it. 
So it's not about knowing all the keyboard shortcuts. It's just at least knowing that they're there or like searching for them and knowing where you can find them. Um, how do you join those two lines again? I'm working on uh, Perez J. So, so one thing here I did want to bring up. So let's say if I have a line, right? Um, and this right now is in a, a vector shape. I'm in vector editing mode. So this right here is its own line. It's a vector 10, right? These are terrible names. So I have these three lines and they're all separate objects. So I can't join them together with the join tool because they're sitting inside of like their own different vector objects. Let's say I want to bring them all into the same vector object. So I'm going to select them all. I'm going to press command E, right? Which is just flatten. When I right click, flatten. So I flatten them together, right? And so now when I double click, they're all inside the same vector editing mode. So now I can select those two points, press command J. I can select these two points and hit command J and it'll join them. So first you just need to make sure that the vector objects are in the same kind of like vector object, right? And then you can change them out. And then here I can hit the command key and I can smooth, you know, this out. By the way, what I love to do too uh, is I'll hit the command key and click right? Just to get some like fun rounded, you know, like shapes, like I'll just come in here and I'll just command click on them and I can command and release them, you know, and, and it helps you. It's like, it's like a little fun exercise um, to kind of control these. And one other thing too, I always try to keep my, my Bezier handles at, at nice angles, right? So 45 degree angles, 90 degree angles um, helps keep that, that work in step. And I always try to add uh, uh, nodes on the edges. All right. And can I fill a shape with an image? Yes. That's actually how shapes work in Figma. So sorry, last last question. So if I have a, like this shape and I have this shape and let's grab, you know, this shape, right? Even though these are, these, this is a stroke. Um, if I hit command shift K and here for the non shortcut aligned file, place image or video. And there it is. Shift command K. Um, I can place one, two, three images and I just click. So here we go. Image, image, and image. And the image went into the fill. I could swap the stroke in the fill as well. So there we go. I have the image inside of that, that icon. All right, cool. So a uh, few other things. Uh, uh, Alex will be sharing a survey in the chat. Uh, be sure to sign up for next month's workshop. You can check out all workshops at figma.com or youtube.com slash uh, figma. Uh, we are have an entire education um, channel there. So you can like, you know, find all of these previous workshops. We will be sending out an email. Uh, let us know how we did. So please like uh, fill out that, 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 that survey so we can become a little bit better and make these workshops a little bit better and make sure that we're, we're serving the needs and, and providing you with the things that you want to learn. Uh, so I really appreciate you all for being here today. This was Icon Basics and Figma. Uh, massive shout out to Alex, who has been in here sharing the links with you, uh, collecting the questions and, and just, you know, assisting with all things. I really appreciate y'all for joining today. Um, feel free to reach out if you do have any questions. Uh, I'm most active on Twitter, unfortunately, uh, at Miggy on Twitter. Um, oh, wait, that's not Alex. Alex, I need your, your proper uh, uh, account on here. Uh, Alex has been doing great for Figma for Education and, and rocking out on, on Twitter as well. So I really appreciate you all today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. I really appreciate you. And uh, yeah, feel free to uh, uh, let us know how we're doing and uh, probably see you in a month. Remember to, to check out config, config.figma.com. Um, check out Noah and Jory's talk. I wanted to make sure I wasn't stealing their thunder. They're going to go into like the real nitty gritty of like true application and building of icons. I built like four here. They've built thousands and thousands and thousands of icons. So their process is going to be a little bit more procedural and uh, man, it's going to be great.